asked me to do this. I said, you want me to play in front of a lot of music teachers? Do you know that I still get nervous when I play in front of people? Uh, and I know I do it because it helps challenge me to overcome obstacles. And it's a good way of reminding your students that, you know, when they have their nervousness, that this is a good experience to try to get them to relax and to enjoy music as well. Knowing that you're playing for the most comfortable audience, really, uh, is people who appreciate and love music. So playing in front of music teachers should be simple. But uh, pianists, though, whew, there's been some times where I've given uh, music. Ed and I were talking about this the other day. It's like sometimes the soloist that's being accompanied by the pianist should just sit down and let the pianist go because some of those accompaniments that you all have to play are just amazingly, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, very tough to play. And uh, if you ever done the Hindemann trumpet sonata, the piano part, the trumpet player might as well go ahead and sit down because the piano part is really on uh, trial. So, uh, but I appreciate all that you all do, those pianists that accompany as well, uh, especially around solo and ensemble time. But uh, the next piece I'm going to do for you is Morning Has Broken. <coughs>
like to introduce uh, Manette Streeter, who's going to be our speaker for today. I'm excited about her being here. Um, I remember Carrie Turner had men uh, mentioned her to us even about a year ago when we said we've got to get her in here. We need to know um, what she has in store for us. There's a lot of uh, really great information, especially with her background. Um, you can see in her biography that she's worked um, with the IRS um, and worked here locally with the military branches and the bases around here, um, helping them with various programs. Um, she's also done lots of really like great things I didn't even know about when I met her, telling us about uh, when she worked with the Reagan administration, um, opening connection with Moscow. I'm like, wow. It's a great, uh, lot of great personal background there um, that she has to tell us about. But join me in welcoming, welcoming Manette Streeter to our program today. In talking with you this morning, I first of all want to say this is not your grandmother's cookie baking music industry. And if you think it is, forget it right now. This camera right here and my good friend Phil Thomas, when we started working together years ago, Phil had a show. He had been a local DJ. He had a show called The Uncharted Zone that it was on television. We teamed up. I put a segment on called Music and Taxes. The listening audience at that period of time, even with streaming video, was 100,000 if we were lucky. In came social media. They came out of Hollywood to work with, Tom, with Phil to get the show changed. The minute it started going on the air, the audience participation went to three and a half million instantly. Okay, three and a half million. Now it's worldwide, and we have an accurate count of every country in the world that is going to be watching. This is not your cookie baking teaching music. This is a whole new world. So really, the focus is going to be get with it. This camera has just filmed this. When it goes on, you are now going to be seen by three and a half million people. Your organization. Okay. Because of that, and keeping that dimension in mind, I want to go in and start with how do you approach today's music business world? You're not baking cookies. Let me give you a scenario. Very serious scenario. You are teaching a high school student. Okay? That high school student leaves your premises and decides that they're going to take part of the information that you taught them and part of the original composition that you all worked together. And he's going to go home and he's going to get with his friends and they're going to film, and they're going to put it on social media, and it's going to be seen by 10 million people. You didn't know that when you were working with him on the piano bench. Okay? But he's decided that he's going to add a few embellishments to that little piece of music that you all were playing around with. Suddenly it's seen by 10 million people all over the world. Somebody in one of those countries picks up that music adds to it, and what happens? Did you know you have got copyright infringement and you just lost the, your royalties? Okay? You just lost your income off of that. And then what happens is you go to the attorney's office and you said, well, they're using it. It's on social media. It started on my piano. I can hear the chords. I can hear the melody. I can hear all of that. And your attorney sits there and says, well, great, big deal. Uh, why didn't you know what you were doing? And number two is, do you have a corporation or do you have a sole proprietorship? Because it's going to make the difference in you, when you go to court. Yes, this is today's music. Welcome to 2012, pushing into 2013. Okay? and so the impact of social media. 
All right. So what happens is this. When you go into business today, it's a very serious decision as to what type of business entity you're going to choose. Many people are used to the sole proprietorship, which is the very small business and the income is reported to the Internal Revenue Service on what's called a Schedule C on your personal return. And that is good for some areas, but for those people that are getting ready to expand, are going to use social media, are going to go international, are going to be teaching folks that are getting ready to go international, it's nothing for bands to be going back and forth all the time. You're going to want to look for some professional advice, either from your accountant, who knows what the international tax treaties are, and the international tax treaties for the music and entertainment industry, which are different. There are special treaties written there. I have worked with Internal Revenue Service uh, international offices out of Washington. So there are different treaties there. If you're not going to go the, uh, that route, then you want to look and get the advice on how to handle it to prevent any kind of serious legal problems. You've got a parent coming in to pick up their child. You do not have a floor that is uh, visitor friendly. You have a floor that has got tile that is ultra slick. Your parent, your child's parent has a slip and fall, has a broken leg. Suddenly you're at the insurance company and you are at the attorney's office because you are getting ready to have a lawsuit. That parent has now lost three months worth of income because of the condition of the floor in your house. Welcome to today's world. So you want to be able to know how you are going to limit liability. What are your choices today in business entities? Today's choices are expansive. That's why you have to go for some professional advice. You've got sole proprietorships. You've got partnerships. Partnerships are almost a thing of the past because they've pretty much been replaced by S corporations. You've got C corporations, and you've got limited liability corporations, which can be taxed at, glazing over, taxed at the S corporation rate or the partnership rate. And those are the most common, but there are a few more under all of those categories. So what happens is your business professional has to know what your, all of your sources of income are, husband and wife income is, what assets are going to be protected, and so on and so forth, what kind of liabilities are going to be facing you in order to help you set up your business. And then we've got the cherry on the top which says, are you going international? And remember, the minute you go on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, any of those, you are international. Okay. Once that business entity has been determined, the next thing is, if it is a corporation, it has to be filed with the state of Florida, Department of Corporations, Secretary of State's office, and you can get basic information on that through sunbiz, S-U-N-B-I-Z dot O-R-G. That is the official state of Florida site and it has the directions and can walk you through how a corporation has to be filed. Best practices scenario is get with your accountant first, your attorney if necessary depending upon what your future holds, and then you'll know how to handle the corporation papers and filing with the state of Florida. Okay, then you've got some other questions. Now these questions, I'm going to tell you, a one-time events. Once you get these next ones done, they're only done one time and your business is good to go for the next 40, 50 years. I'm going to ask you a question before I get into this part of it. I just came back from Auburn University for the annual IRS Auburn Tax Conference. And one of the primary questions was asked from the 200 people that were there. 
how many of you are going to live to the age of 100? And a bunch of hands went up. Half the room, because they are staying current. Longevity right now is to the age of 100. Some insurance companies are saying longevity is to the age of 121, and they will guarantee premiums. United of Omaha has that in their latest public brochure, 121. Most of you in this room are just getting started. Okay, You're going to see things in the music industry 40 years from now, when you're still in business, you hadn't dreamed of today. So, and that's today. That's today's world. This is a fast-moving world, kiddos. So what happens is, with, this, with these new licenses that you're going to be getting for your corporation or your business, let it, if you're going to be in business for the next 30, 40 years, if you're 55 today, you're going to be in business at 85 to 90. You can guarantee it. It was all over the news last night on Bloomberg. Okay. So the news is finally catching up with reality and the insurance companies. So what happens is this is going to be a one-time event, your federal identification number. When you get that for your business, that's going to be good forever. So. That's going to take care of you for the next 40 years of business. Your business license with the county is probably going to have to be just about the same. It's just going to be, once it's issued and your numbers are issued, the governmental entities try to keep them in place. And your sales tax. Sales tax is a new issue, and I would suggest that when you go down to the sales tax office, you tell them how you are running your business and let them determine what your sales tax obligations are. Okay. And if you don't, you could very easily wind up with a knock on the door from sales tax. So those are your, business, your major business licenses. Your registrations with the Internal Revenue Service are totally free of charge. Now, let's move into the types of income. Once again, this is a new dimension, completely new dimension. I have talked with people from the music industry. I'm going to give you a really good example. It's what happened this, this week, if you're not familiar with it. I, myself, with my company, Music and Taxes, I'm a corporate sponsor of Gulf Coast Citizen Diplomacy Council, which pairs with the U.S. State Department in bringing people from all over the world into Pensacola. This week, we had the Edward R. Murrow International Journalist here in Pensacola. We had 17 of them. And then we also had Tuesday night we had a major reception where we got the annual figures and we have brought in over 350 international delegates last year alone. Now, if you want to check the website, please do. The, the listings of who has come and what countries is mind-boggling. You may not have even known that they were here. But the website is gulfcoastdiplomacy.org. And on the sidebar, you'll see the sponsorships, both the corporate sponsorships and the county and city sponsorships. And you'll see music and taxes listed among them. But when I was there on Monday, uh, we were having a reception at uh, Seville Quarter. And we had these delegates from the various countries of Sub-Saharan Africa. So hey, we had journalists representing their newspapers from all of these countries in South Africa. The gentleman sitting right next to me, I sit down, I introduce myself, give him my business card. I had done a little homework on the internet. I'm a home, I'm an internet junkie. I'm going to get that, get up. You're going to hear me say a lot about internet. I think it's the greatest thing. 
So I tell him that I had done some homework and I had read his newspaper on the internet over the weekend. And I saw that there was a big article in his newspaper. Now he's from Mozambique. About music festivals down there. Well, I'm going to tell you the conversation was off and running then because he's a musician. Okay? So you know what happens when two musicians get together? There's no way of stopping the conversation. But he's also talking about when he finds out that I'm a member of the American Bar Association, Intellectual Property, International Intellectual Property Divisions, he says, you know, we've got this terrible problem with copyright infringement and everybody stealing each other's work and making money off of it. And I had to laugh and say, what else is new? That's an international problem. And it is. Okay. But that lets you know that we have got these musicians that were all over that room. They were journalists in their paid time. But in their personal time, they were jamming with an instrument and some of their friends. And the next question was, when we changed tables, and I'm with a gentleman from Rwanda to my right, and we're talking, he has just started a radio station in Rwanda. Well, it's one of the first things he wants to know, is how can I get the musicians into the United States to play at your festivals, and your local festivals? Okay. International music. It's all over Pensacola, you just didn't know about it. And we're trying to get that kind of word out, too because it's there. And if any of you are interested, I would love to have you go with me to, with any of these delegations when they come in. We have delegations coming in twice a month. Okay, so much for the commercial. But what happens is when you're keeping this in mind, let's put it into a dollars and cents business context. You have got one of your music students that you're working with and maybe you're actually doing the arranging and they want you to do the arranging on it and it is going to be filmed and they call Phil and they say, let's film Phil, you've got these international contacts, you've been working with them for years, we want to put this uh, DVD on social media and have it ready to be sold. And Phil says, oh, that's not a problem, and we get that set up with PayPal, okay? So that anybody in the world on the internet is buying this, and they're paying through it with PayPal, and the money's deposited in your, your bank account. You've got to protect those royalties. You've got to protect that intellectual property. You've got to protect those copyrights or you put it on internet, okay? But the money flows in that way. 10 years ago, it would have been impossible. Now it's an everyday event, every day, big deal. So what happens is that money, because it's going through credit card payment, IRS has a new regulation that went into force last year, last tax season. And that is, all credit card payments are going to be reportable by the credit card company directly to the Internal Revenue Service. And guess what? You're going to get another 1099 to add to your collection that comes in on January. But this is going to be showing all of your income that you received from credit card transactions. Okay? Is it a problem? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Your tax person knows how to handle it. But what is the positive part of it? It's an ability for you to work with the people who are coming to you, who are participating in this type of international business, and you're going to be able to work with it. Okay? All right. Now, Differences between reporting on your income tax return, income from a 1099 versus a W-2. 
Now, if you've been around for a while, you already know the answer. If you're new to business, let me explain. The W-2 form is when you are an employee. And one of our best examples is someone who is an employee of a religious facility who has you on a salary and is deducting federal income tax and paying Social Security, Medicare, and withholding Social Security and Medicare from your check. That is an employee, and that is a W-2 form. What is the 1099? Some of the 1099s that we see in this area, you're already familiar with if you're playing with your major or uh, not-for-profit organizations in the music community that I've been affiliated with on uh, administrative level off and on for about 20 years. So then you've got a 1099 from them. Now, that 1099, when it's used to report, it has got to go on the business return. Now here's your catch. And this is a real important catch because I've had to send some of these back to the not-for-profit organizations for correction. The music person decides that they, with adequate advice, that they need to file an S-corporation and change their business entity. So they're changing it to the S-corporation. But somehow they forgot to tell this music organization that they're playing with regularly that they made the change. So the music organization issues the 1099 in their personal name with their personal social security number. IRS then processes that. And IRS processes it as individual and slams all of the additional income taxes that come with individual taxation onto it. And suddenly they are panicked because this was not the reason that they wanted to keep that business entity. They wanted the benefits of an S corporation. So said, well, fine. Did you happen to tell the payroll department or the person, the secretary treasurer of the organization that you had changed business entities and now have a federal ID number? You know that little sign that says, well, duh? Uh, okay. That becomes apparent with the answer. So what happens is if they're going to get, and this is for your information, if this should happen to you, only the company that issues the 1099 has the legal right to make the change. So you've got to tiptoe back, give the information to them, have them change and issue the federal identification number okay, under the corporation and reissue it under the corporation name and then you can do it. And warning, red flag warning here. Don't wait until April the 13th to do this because otherwise you're going to have to put everything under extension. Okay. What happens if it's not done? Fellas, I don't want to impugn your egos, but I'm going to tell you up front, when I was teaching for 10 years with Internal Revenue Service, we had a saying, for every really serious bad audit, there's a man's hand attached to that piece of paper. Women get these things taken care of. Guys don't. Okay? So if it's a guy in your family pending no divorce clause in this, okay, and fix him a really good dinner to do it, get him down there and get that changed with internal revenue. Otherwise, you're going to have 18 months worth of IRS notices. You may have to make a trip to the Internal Revenue Service and amend tax returns. Okay. So as a, these ID numbers are very, very serious. This is total computer processing. The computer doesn't know you and does not care. They're going to ship out those notices anyway. Okay. 
All right, let's move on to something that's a little more friendly. And it's called depreciation and depreciation in equipment. Phil and I were sitting and talking. We looked at that piano over there with the price tag of $25,000, which is a nominal, reasonable price in today's market for an instrument that is that beautiful. Very reasonable price. But let's take that as an everyday example. Come in, you buy your piano. You want to put it on the tax return. How was that done? It's depreciation. And there are a couple of types of depreciation. Some of you may have talked with your accountant or read in your tax information about Section 179 depreciation. That's a once a year expensing depreciation, which is currently part of the fiscal cliff that you're hearing about on TV. Because unless Congress allows it to stand as it is and reinforces the provisions for the past couple of years, the dollar amount for that depreciation is going to roll back to 25000 which means that piece of, of instrument would only be allowed to have the first 25000 of its price tag under Section 179, and the rest of it would pass through to another year. So we're getting ready to see some major issues between now and January that are based on depreciation. All I can say is stay tuned and stay informed. We are not going to know until midnight, December 31st, what is or what isn't. And I'm not kidding. I think most, some of us have been used to sitting up watching television at 11 o'clock at night on December 31st to see exactly what Congress was doing, okay? Because they were taking the vote at 10 minutes at 12. That's not unusual anymore. So, that's one of the things on depreciation we're looking at right now. The next thing on your equipment, and this is very important because you're in hurricane zone, always, always, always have an appraisal available for your insurance company in case of natural disaster. We musicians lost huge amounts of instruments during Hurricane Ivan and Hurricane Katrina, and the Nashville flood. If you're not familiar with what happened up there in Nashville, and it's just happened with Hurricane Sandy in New York, there have been large storage companies that have specialized in the storing of music instruments, uh, video equipment, sound equipment, and so on. It's specialized. Um, acoustics so that there is uh, control, you do not have humidity issues and so on. The Nashville flood hit in 2010. It flooded the entire warehouse right off of the Cumberland River. I work with lots of people in the top 10 percent and the large studios in Nashville. These session musicians lost everything that when they had it stored there. How many of them had an appraisal? Need I say more? How many of them had insurance? Need I say more? How many of them took a 100% loss? Lots. We're talking about, and if you're familiar with your instruments and the values, and I'm sure you are, you're talking about a Fender guitar that's got a estimated value of two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Gone. No appraisal. No insurance. Cannot be used. Totally damaged. Once you already know that once the humidity and the water got into the body, 
the sound is gone. The sound can never be replaced. So, you need to say which is more important. My run around for six weeks over here that is absolutely worthless to me and I'm just throwing money at the wall or going and getting some serious insurance to protect my valuable business. And that is a, in today's world, that is a choice. Because I talk with business people all the time. Do they have the money? Absolutely. How are they using it? That is to be determined. Do they, do they protect their business and their investment first? Are you kidding? Okay. They're running out after every sale flyer on a Tonka toy that their kids are going to use for two and a half weeks and then it's gone. Okay. Your business comes first. Your investment comes first. Please reconsider how you are using your money in your business and protect your investment with insurance and appraisals. The next thing is, if there is a natural disaster, that insurance company, if you have not gotten an appraisal, they will want a copy of your federal income tax return depreciation schedule. I've worked with hundreds of these. Where is the issue and the problem for those who are in music? You, as musicians, have an instrument that has an accelerating value. The older it gets, the more valuable it can become. Which is different from the fellow who has got a screwdriver and a hammer and so on. That's expendable. But music instruments are not. And those appraisals need to be done at least once every 10 to 15 years to get the fair market value because your instruments ascend in value. An example, I'm going to go back to Hurricane Island. We have had musicians here that have had violins, for instance that they had purchased and the fair market value as a collector's who was entering the area of collectors had pushed the value of that up to sixty thousand dollars for the time that they have had it. And because of the year in the make. No insurance, no appraisal. Gone. It's enough to make you cry. So, am I a little hard on that? Absolutely. Because I have seen a lot of people lose everything that they had for no reason. For no reason. Because they didn't stop to think about how they were going to use their business dollar. Okay. Okay, now, that's depreciation, that is appraisals. That is your natural disasters, which we have so many of here, and more coming. I don't know if you all watched Weather Channel today, but uh, they had a big interview with former Vice President Gore on climate change. What has happened with Hurricane Sandy, Ivan, Katrina, is top news right now. Okay. And, it's a f and everybody who is in business is having to rethink every dollar that they get. So, insurance appraisal is important to you all. Next on the list is the mileage versus the actual expenses on your transportation expenses. This is always an interesting one. And let me back into this because this actually started with uh, the hurricanes along the Gulf Coast and how it affected the refineries 
along Louisiana and Texas after hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and smaller ones too that were completely knocking out the refineries. And suddenly you all went to the pump and said, what? You know, and you got to make a choice between whether you were going to have steak, hamburger, or gas in the tank. And that became a reality. That became a reality. And then you got to file your tax return that year, and it's another what? Because Congress had said, okay, the last half of the year, and remember this always happens last half of the year. Why? Because that's hurricane season that makes this change. The last half of the year, summer months through November, the prices escalated, the taxes escalated with that, and so therefore they changed the mileage rates on the tax returns. Suddenly you go to do your tax return and your tax consultant says, okay, I need the mileage for January through June, because that's one rate, and the mileage July through December. That's a completely different rate. Okay. All right, the rate for upcoming return is, go is supposed to be, this is before Hurricane Sandy, before Hurricane Sandy. It's supposed to be 55 and a half cents a mile. We don't know until Congress comes back in session what is going to happen with the mileage rates, right? Because very well, if it has affected our gasoline, gasoline prices, refineries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of the checklists that they have to go down, then they may have to split the gear again. So. When you're preparing all of your records on a monthly or quarterly basis, make sure that you have your mileage, your odometer readings. Now, you look at me and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have an odometer reading for January. That's the last thing on my list of things to do. There is a safe harbor. In IRS language, we call it a safe harbor. And it's this. And especially good for women. I mean, this is what I call a women's part of the deduction. Because gals don't get under the car and pull the valve and let all of the oil out. Okay? They run down to one of these really quick places to get the oil changed. They're in and out in 15 minutes, and, and that's great. But here's the good part for them. Each one of those places has got a mileage place on the invoice. Okay? IRS accepts that. Accepts that. And so if at the end of the year you go to do the tax return, pull out your invoices where you had the loop and the oil change. And take your beginning and your ending mileage reading. Now the next thing is, you're thinking to yourself, I use my car 100% business. Think again. No one on the face of this earth does that. Okay? You're driving down the street and you say, oh, I need to stop in at the convenience store, which is on the next block, and pick up something and come back in the car and suddenly you've got out of your way and you come back in. Or I've got to go down over here and pick up the dry cleaning. Or I'm going over here to pick up my grandchildren or my children at the daycare center. That's personal use. Have you driven 100%? You intended to. Did it happen? No. Okay. Reality sets in. So IRS says, do a safe harbor. Take out at least, adjust those figures, at least 15 to 25 percent for personal use. And then that's giving you what's called a safe harbor that pretty much stays within that area. So those are some of the top things, some of the interesting different things for today's world, for today's uh, music industry. 
and I will be glad to answer any questions when the meeting is over. Why? First of all, number one, in order for me to answer your question, I might have to ask some personal information, some details. I'm under professional ethics, okay? IRS has got one of the hardest set of professional ethics there are. And because of that, we kind of stop asking questions in public and say, we'll answer them all day for you, but where you feel secure in answering them. Okay. So I'll be glad to uh, stand over there and uh, have a cup of coffee with you and answer them. Okay. I want to say thank you and I want to mention one little bitty thing which is totally unusual. It has not made the press, but remember I'm talking international. I've talked natural disaster with Gulf Coast Diplomacy and you see my bio. Gulf Coast Diplomacy, I'm registered with <coughs> countries of serious interest. And of course, first on the list, because I worked with this with the Reagan administration and the embassy and the Kremlin, uh, and that is Russia, Ukraine, Cuba has come on my list now, I've come on my radar. And you may or you may not know, but I call this friendship at best. Hurricane Sandy on the news has left thousands and thousands of people cold. We're hearing that on the news every day. Elderly, cold. Sick and disabled, cold. Russia has just filled two cargo planes with 50 tons, that's a lot, girls, 50 tons of supplies that have just landed in New York, which includes almost a total of 50 tons of solid wool blankets for the people of New York and New Jersey. And our ambassador from the United States has already said thank you. And you may want to keep that up. Okay. I enjoyed being with you, and maybe next year we can fill in what has happened. Okay. Ms. Streeter, I have one question that's very general, and it's about um, terms. And if you would allow me to ask it, there are others in the room that might want to hear the same answer. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain the difference between a sole proprietorship and corporations? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Corporation, and that's, a, that's one of the biggest and most common questions. A sole proprietorship is exactly that. It is one person owning it, but it is not incorporated. So that if there, and what the most common um, purpose is for a corporation is to limit liability. Now, I'm not saying limited liability LLC corporation, so please do not misconstrue that. So that's what then we have different means. types of corporations, but those different types of corporations limit the liability. And so by setting that up, your most common um, scenario would be, remember we did the slip and fall kind of thing? Mm -hmm. If that had happened on corporation premises, and if there was a lawsuit, that lawsuit would be for the corporation first, okay, and try to protect the business owner's personal liability, their home, their family, their personal cars, uh, those types of things. So there used to be a thing called the corporate veil. Well, they tore that one up a long time ago. Any businessman knows that. But now there is a hierarchy where they go to corporate first and then personal. When you're in business and you have a corporation, you're going to want your insurance, your business liability insurance, made out in the name of the corporation. So it isolates everything into that corporation and, and heaven forbid something should happen, your attorneys would be defending you on the corporate level first. 
before the personal. And there are different federal income tax forms and reporting requirements for each one of these. And at that point, you want to get with either your attorney or you want to get with your tax professional to sort it out. We spend a lot of time in our continuing education. We have to have X number units of continuing education, and I also have X number of units with continuing education with the Bar Association in this. So, easy answer, no. sweetie. There is no easy answers today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have another jury question. Yeah. You talked about sales taxes. Um, under the current laws, am I to understand right that we should be calculating what our sales tax would be? This is a new area that a lot of people in in music and in these sales are just getting involved in. Okay. And it depends upon how you are running your particular business. All right. Here are your two scenarios. Scenario one, you are giving music lessons. That's all you are giving. You are not coming down, buying sheet music, and taking it back for your students to buy from you. Okay? That's not happening. It's lessons only, labor only, no sales tax involved. Some of you want to be able to purchase music so that you know exactly what your uh, people are going to be learning from and you are literally reselling it to your student. In that case, you go down, you get your sales tax number. There's going to be an exemption card there with a number. You bring it in, you give it to the fellas here, okay? They keep a copy. If there was ever a question by sales tax, they have to have a copy of that exemption. You get it every year. You buy whatever sheet music or whatever uh, music you want for your students, but you do not pay the sales tax to Dollar Hut because you're going to retail that. You collect that sales tax from your student, and then your sales tax office, because you're very small, and they probably will not have a large amount of sales by any means, they're going to set you up on quarterly or semi-annually reporting. And then you send maybe the three to six months worth of sales tax that you collected onto the state. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, so what is the question in point? Are you selling the music to them or are you doing only the teaching and you're sending them down here for them to ring up the music with you. Okay? If I might, uh, yeah. kind of straight on Bill Dollar High. Yeah. We've met him for a while. Yes, I know. Thank you for coming today. Uh, if, if, if you're going to have, some of you are doing it one way, some of you are doing it the old, the old way. Uh, we, we understand these things very well and will guide you. So uh, we're here to help you use whichever of those you choose. Uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, that's probably one of your strongest points here. Is Bill knows what the sales tax laws are. He's been working with you all this time. You're not going to have a big problem with it. Just listen to what he says, uh, as long because he's going to ask you what you're doing with your business. We have refrained from telling you what you should do because you run your business, not us. So you haven't seen us in a position of telling you anything. Um, you now are learning some things that make you more educated, and so we're glad to work with you on your business. And so literally, here. he's able to say, well, if you're going to retail this, I'm not charging you the sales tax. If you're not, I have to charge you we the sales tax. We have teachers that are doing that. They are yeah. very definitely in the very small minority. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, that's a sign of the times. The state wants it every single penny they can get. When, when did, what we're speaking of, when did that begin? What year? It's been in existence a long, long time. But it is just coming to the point where they're beginning to look at it and say, okay, this is something that is large enough for us to look at. They're looking at dimes and quarters now. They used to look at $100, hundred dollar bills. And if it was below a certain amount, forget it. 
It's not that way anymore. Yeah. Any other general questions? <laughs> I hope I haven't scared you to death. <laughs> okay. When, when you're getting ready, I will, I will close with one idea. Okay. So this whole thing doesn't become a nightmare when you go to sleep tonight. Um, when you're writing that check to any of the government entities, remember, that check in part has paid for your children's education, it has paid for the hospital that's down the street from you. It is paying for the ambulance that's going to get you there in case of emergency. It's paying for the street that you're on right here. Otherwise, you would be on dirt. Okay? Just look around you and see where it's going. Okay. We're lucky today uh, to have um, two guys from Yamaha with us that are here to uh, beat up on me, but uh, <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, we're learning from each other. Uh, Ed Bezerzik is the marketing manager for the keyboard division of Yamaha. He's here from Wayne Park, California. He's one of the management guys from the home office. Um, he does marketing for all of the United States, is that correct? Okay. And then Simon Haas is, what is your job title? <laughs> I'm sales and marketing director for Bosen Law for a company in Vienna worldwide. And so so he's traveled here from Vienna just wow. to see you. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Go eat shrimp. Uh, uh, anybody been to Vienna? Yeah, no. great place. Go to the Busendorfer showroom and, and hall there if you, if you ever go. Uh, Margaret and I have been to Vienna one time, and you bet we made a beeline there. It is in the back side of the most beautiful concert hall, and, and acoustically beautiful concert hall in the world. Um, you, have, you have to go to Vienna before you die. Put it on your butt. <laughs> But they are here today uh, working with us, and I wanted them to be introduced to our... Uh, this is pretty much the core group of uh, leadership and participation in a much larger organization. Uh, uh, very good. Thank you very much for... Glad to. Glad to. I just wanted Thank to introduce them. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Gallery night, uh, and also the next month, we don't have a formal meeting.